thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to come celebrate the 175th year alumni panel with us. And now we're just gonna jump right in and get started, okay? So I'd like everyone to welcome Dr. Charles Blackman. Dr. Blackman. is our most seasoned alumni of the college. Um, he is class of 1946, so he was on campus from 1942 to 1946, so right during World War II. So um, Dr. Blackman, tell us what it was like on campus during that time. Thank you, it's good to be here. Um, 70 something years later. Wow. In 1942, there were all of 230 students enrolled at Olivet. And uh, US 27 ran right through the middle of the campus. And there were two additional buildings that you folks have never, most of you have never seen. Shepherd Hall, which is uh, now the site of the Kirk Center, and Mather Hall, which uh, was somewhere back of us here. Uh, those buildings, of course, one of them burned, the other one deliberately taken down before it fell down. Um, one of the fun things about uh, all of that was when I arrived here and went to room 206 of Blair Hall, I found a note from my roommate on top of the four drawer dresser. And Rudy Hurt said, since you are six feet two, I took the bottom two drawers of the dresser. <laughs> <laughs> and I think really that encompasses the spirit of this institution from the word go. And uh, I've appreciated my linkage, uh, not only um, from that four-year period, but off and on ever since. Dr. Blackman, you were here during uh, the uh, enlistment for World War II, yes. and as well as people returning from World War yes. II. Do you want to, can you talk about that for a sec? Uh, I was 17 when I arrived here, and most of the, my compatriots were 18, and uh, had already registered for the draft, and there was a general exodus in the spring of 1943, uh, when probably 20 or 25 students in my class went off to take their physical exams. Uh, I, did, I had to do that a year later, but did not pass the exam, so I stayed on uh, in the college. But during that time, the numbers dropped to 129. If you can imagine keeping the doors open, we had a very, very dedicated faculty, and they were determined to keep all of it open, and they succeeded. And we um, had someone distinguished return from war yes, your senior year. Uh, and in my senior year, there were people coming back, including uh, John Swainson, who was a double amputee and later became governor of Michigan. Oh, my goodness, um, that's right. He, in turn, was an Olivet grant. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so next we're going to hear from Walt Parker, class of 1958. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Walt was a history and English major, and um, I would read his bio if I were you. Um, Walt was here during a tumultuous time, so tell us about the 1950s on campus. Um, I also arrived here at the ripe old age of 17, <laughs> and I'm glad that those dedicated people had managed to keep the doors open. Um, when I came here, Dwight Eisenhower was president of the United States, and Dr. Raymond Blakeney was president of Olivet College. Our boys were returning from Korea and the U.S. Supreme Court was grappling with Brown versus the Board of Education. And it concluded that 
um, separate but equal, was indeed separate but not equal. Uh, a reasonable question to ask would be how that felt on this campus, segregation on the Olivet campus. And I can say to you that I don't think any of the kids who were here felt oppressed by segregation on this campus. Um, one of the things that was very impressive to me that suggested that Olivet was ahead of the curve was that the interaction that I had with other schools in the MIAA was on the athletic fields. And when I was here, Olivet, Adrian, and Hillsdale had black athletes, or as we were called in those days, Negroes. We've answered to many different appellations over time. Uh, I saw no black athletes at Calvin, Hope, Kalamazoo, Alma, Albion in four years. So again, I say that on this campus, we felt kind of insulated. Mm -hmm. um, then as now, there were conversations that needed to be held, and they were always difficult conversations as they remain to this day. But the, the climate here was a very uh, receptive and welcoming, and uh, it was an experience experience that I wouldn't have missed for the world. I loved my time here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next we have Woody Wiley. He's a character. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> so Woody's from Tennessee, and he was an English education major from the class of 1968, speaking of the tumultuous time in the country. Um, so you saw things like the Vietnam War, JFK, MLK, MLK. So tell us about what was like on campus when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Well, first let me just say that if I can quote from Tale of Two Cities, you know, the 60s were the best of times and the worst of times uh, in so many different respects. But... <clears throat> When Martin Luther King was, uh, was assassinated, it, of course, was a great shock to the whole country. Here, um, the impact came almost, the, well, it was the day after. I'm guessing now that there were maybe two dozen, maybe a few more uh, African-American students on campus. And we were all friends. I mean, you know, the African-American students were in uh, the societies, uh, belonged to all the clubs. I mean, we were just all good friends. I never saw any uh, hint of, of bigotry on, on campus. But the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, the, we came into uh, the Collegiate Center for uh, a meal, and uh, lo and behold, all of the uh, black students were sitting together off in a corner, all of them. And I, that left so many of us wondering, what's going on? We realized there must be a connection, clearly. But that went on for days and days. And then finally, I, I caught one of my fraternity brothers who was part of that group, and I said, what, what's going on here? And he said, uh, we're making a point. That's all he said. And it lasted for maybe a week. And then just like it began, it ended and everything was back to normal. Mm. Um, during the Vietnam uh, period, and of course 1968 was one of the most tumultuous years as far as the Vietnam co uh, conflict was concerned. There were no protests on, on this campus. It was very quiet, uh, and as has already been pointed out, we felt probably pretty insulated. I don't remember too many even worrying about the draft, um, which is surprising because, uh, you know, that was, that was a hot button with so many college students. And I don't remember anybody not coming back in the fall because they had been drafted. Okay. So we were very fortunate in that, res in that respect. But uh, it's all part of the wonderful memories that, uh, that I have of this campus. Thank you. <clears throat> Speaking
Speaking of the military, our next uh, alumni is Tala Welch, She's class of 1977. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Tala is a retired Navy captain uh, from Niles, Michigan, and she's a music education English major. Um, and so Tala, in the 70s, we were still seeing Vietnam. We saw Kent State, where college students were shot on campus. Um, we also saw a lot of environmental work. Um, we saw the EPA come. We saw the Clean Air and Clean Water Act. So looking back now as a 30-year veteran of the military, how, how did that impact your campus life? What, ha what, what memories do you have about that? I, I am sad to say this, but back in the 70s, I was not as politically enlightened as I am today. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, Kent State, I think, affected everyone when that occurred and the loss of life and the um, unrestrained use of force. Um, it did not go without note, but as far as the EPA and the other significant changes, you know, Microsoft was formed as well as Apple was formed in the 70s. It, it was a flyby, you know, it was, so. Okay, <laughs> again, insulated. We were very insulated mm -hmm. and despite what happened at Kent State, we were happy. It was a happy place Thank for you. many reasons. Good, Thank you. Okay, so next we're going to meet Audra Carlson. I'm just going to switch down the table like this. Excuse me. Um, Audra's from the class of 1987. She lives in Detroit. Um, she's a business major. Um, so Audra, as a business major, you were probably paying attention to the economy of the 1980s. Um, how did that uh, impact your college experience, and did that impact your major or your selection of a major? So, uh, you know, coming into college as a 17-year-old, um, coming from Cass Tech, and I had uh, majored in business at Cass Tech also, uh, you know, I wanted to be able to go back to the city of Detroit and, and make an impact. Uh, the song that I picked for my favorite song, you know, Run DMC, Wake Up, you know, it talks about unemployment and that sort of thing. So my eye was always on that and being able to positively uh, go home and impact um, <coughs> a city that I love dearly. So. And so what was it like on campus during that time? So campus life, uh, you know, we had a couple big things happen. One of the biggest things that in impacted us nationally was the explosion with the... Um, the Challenger. The Challenger. And so I remember... 84? 84. Thank and you. so I remember coming to um, uh, the, the cafeteria area, and we had small TVs then, and just seeing it replay over and over. And so we didn't have big screens, right? So, you know, on these little colored TVs, you see this explosion over and over, and, and we were all enthralled, like, wow. And uh, one of our panelists talked about there was an educator uh, that was on that, uh, right. at, on that shuttle. Uh, and, you know, it was a fourth grade educator, um, and uh, that deeply impacted us. Uh, another thing, um, when we started being, um, you know, concentrating on celebrity, so uh, Marvin Gaye. <laughs> oh, uh, nice. Uh, his father murdered him, right? And so that was while we were here. And so he was an iconic Motown uh, um, celebrity. And, and so that impacted us as well. So those were the two big things socially that impacted me while I was on campus. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to the best decade, the 1990s. <laughs> yeah, you know it's true. Uh, please meet Jeff Bell. Uh, Jeff is class of 99, insurance business major. You okay? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Jeff, by the 90s, things were starting to turn around economically, even with the whole grunge thing we had going on. You guys may not know what that is. Super amazing. Mm. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, there was still a lot of racial unrest around the world. Um, and as in the United States, we had the L.A. riots. We had the Oklahoma City bombing, which was the f kind of the first... 
um, big nationally uh, known kind of terrorist attack, if you will. Um, what was campus like in the 90s? So I guess I'll start um, by, by touching on your comment about racial unrest mm -hmm. and just, you know, my background, I'm from a very small town, Quincy, Michigan. It's not, not far from here, but, you know, coming to Olivet, my exposure to diversity um, was, was pretty limited. So, I mean, I felt like, you know, from my perspective, you know, I saw everyone as equal. I'm, I'm doing my part. But I think when I got to Olivet is when that helped start open my eyes into what really diversity means. Um, it's just not a color issue. It's, it's everything about that person, thought, background, you know, it's so that Olivet really opened my eyes to that because here I, you know, meet people from all over the world. You know, I think we started to see more students come from overseas mm -hmm. that came. So, um, you know, while I probably didn't appreciate what that did for me as much in the moment, you know, now when I look back um, and have been involved in diversity initiatives with the companies I work for, um, just, just really how Im important that issue is. And I think all of that really is what opened my eyes to that. So I think that was good. But, you know, I, I did, you know, I think I was here from 95 to 99. And I think like the OJ verdict when that happened was, was probably the thing that happened here. And I just remember that was, I mean, nothing bad happened, you know, here as a result of that. Um, I know there did, you know, across the country. Um, so that was like a, a unique experience for me. I was a freshman and I just didn't really know how to, how to react to that. So, um, you know, from, from that standpoint, that's, that's kind of how I felt for that. And then, you know, with the Oklahoma City bombing, that was before I got to college, but I mean, that was kind of unprecedented in a lot of our right. opinion. So it really just kind of made every stop and think about what's really possible like out there. And then, you know, obviously that's the issue that's not gone away. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Next, my friend Mo Polly. Uh, Mo's from Chicago. Yes. Mo, did something happen to you in the last 12 hours that you want to tell us <laughs> yeah, about? Yeah, my uh, I have I am a new uncle. My sister yes. gave birth Yay. at 3:20 in the morning. Um, but yeah, so good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Oh, my name tag fell off. I'll forget who I am. <laughs> Can't have that. Um, so Moa's class of 2007. Um, I think it's very interesting that your secondary education social studies. Yeah. Okay. Minor we'll get, in biology. We'll, we'll get back to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you were on campus for something, and all of these I think were things that many of us remember throughout history, but something more recently for all of us. Mo was on campus one year after 9-11. And so I'm wondering if you can tell us kind of what that was like yeah. and how was it coming to college um, and uh, recognizing the one year anniversary of something like that? Yeah, um, well, I can remember vividly when 9-11 happened. I was a senior in high school. Um, I had a cross country meet that day that was canceled. Um, I actually witnessed the uh, second airplane hit the tower on live TV. I'll never forget that. Um, flash forward a year later, I'm here on campus, you know, coming from a big city, three million people, to a small little town. Um, it was different. It, again, it was still very, very raw. Um, you know, people were still running, buying American flags. Uh, I know the Meyer in Charlotte was still <coughs> running out of flags a year later. Um, and it was just a, a different time we had uh, a few of my fraternity brothers were in the military mm -hmm. at the time in the time, so they didn't know what was going on. Uh, so there was a lot of a lot of things going on. But campus, I would say, was very patriotic, very mellow. Um, and I do remember a year later, we actually had a cross country meet uh, at uh, I believe it was Calvin College, and we had a moment of silence, which. Again, it's it was it's just very interesting to witness that before you know the gun sets off and you start the race. Um, but yeah, it was interesting. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Okay, so we're coming to our most recent uh, alumni and. 
pre-alumni. That's what we're, that's what we're calling Brittany. Um, so Aaron Parrish is class of 2018. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> also from Niles, Michigan. Um, she's working on her DPT in physical therapy. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Honestly, that's kind of contradicting, but yeah, my DPT is Doctor of Physical Therapy. So. Okay. Oh, so I said it twice. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry about good. that. <laughs> oh, that was fine. <laughs> All right. So, Aaron, um, you got to see some really unprecedented political things that I wanted to um, talk about. Um, first African American president, first woman to run for president, um, first business slash non political person as president. So how did all of those things um, change your outlook or how did those kind of manifest on campus? So for me, um, I mean, through it, I was uh, in high school and then in college as the presidency was going on. Um, but for me, it just kind of showed that like we're here, we're trying to make a difference in the world no matter what um, avenue we're taking. And it was just kind of showing us that like we can do whatever we want to do, not saying that any president is not fit for something in that sense, no political um, side of it, but just showing that like, no matter where we're from, um, what we wanna do in life, like we can do what we wanna do. Um, become president, be um, basketball coach, be um, parents, just any type of educator, we can, we can make a difference no matter our background. So I think um, seeing the different type of presidencies and the candidates for it just shows that as individuals, especially in college, um, we're just trying to figure out life right now. I'm still trying to figure out life, even though I graduated, because <laughs> um, I'm still in school. But it just shows that like what we're doing impacts others in small ways and big ways, and that we all can make a difference. So, so it's been a year. You haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm still in school. I'm passing, so that's oh, okay. that's key. Right. You got um, some things figured. I'm out. I'm a recent dog mom, so yeah, the whole parenting school it's thing. It's hard. So if single moms out there, even if the dog, I'll give it to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, and finally, our pre-alumni, Brittany. Uh, Brittany Woo! is class of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. And she's pre-med. Yes. She's super smart. Uh, so, That's Brittany, right. you have another year on campus. Yep. And so hearing from all of our previous alumni um, and hearing all the things that's happened over time, what, from your perspective, is different or the same on campus today that has been over time? I have to say there's actually a lot of similarities and differences. I feel like the diversity and inclusion has definitely grown over campus. You know, when I first came here, there was only nine black girls. And now I can look around and I see so many. And I see so many people of all, you know, different races and backgrounds, you know, mm -hmm. Hispanic and Asian. I think that's nice. And everybody just kind of gets along. So there's so much room for growth and development. Um, but nonetheless, I feel like Olivet is just such a welcoming and loving community, just like what Walt said, the community and on campus. So anything different from what we talked about in the past? They don't call us. Names like what Walt was saying. Okay. I'm actually called Brittany. Oh. I, I think that means something, though. That's you know, fantastic. Just, yeah. 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 <laughs> really good. Okay, so you've met all of our panelists and heard a little bit about their time on campus. So we're going to open it up to some popcorn questions. Um, and I see um, cards circulating. So just a reminder that if you have questions, make sure you fill out the cards, pass them towards the uh, center stairs, and we'll keep picking those up, okay? So I wanted to go back to a few panelists, uh, Woody and Tala and uh, Brittany and Aaron, to talk about something that we talked about a little bit last night um, at our dinner that you guys all share in common, and that is fear in our schools. And so for Woody and Tala, in the 1950s, they were taught something called duck and cover. Who remembers? Yeah, there's a couple. Thank you. Look at that. Yay! Um, duck and cover was how you're supposed to hide under your desk to mm -hmm. um, hide from a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. Under your desk. <laughs> nuclear bomb. No judging. Just, I'm not quite 
not sure how that works, science major, so it just doesn't quite line up. Um, and then more recently, um, the active shooter drills. And I'm sure many of you on campus, if not all of you, have participated in an active shooter drill. And so I wonder if any of you wants to talk about how that has impacted your either your college experience or your school experience or anything like that. Anyone want to take that first? I'll take it. Okay. Woody. There, <clears throat> there was a turtle and his name was Bert and he knew just what, what to do, <laughs> duck and cover. That uh, I don't remember in elementary school, to be honest with you, that we're, that uh, we were trained to duck and cover, but when you really think about it, they were the, the films that were on TV told you to lie in a ditch, yep. um, hide in, a, uh, in an alley <laughs> if you live in a city, um, <laughs> and yet we were watching films, you know, gun, uh, military films sh showing the after effects of, at of atomic uh, or nuclear explosions, like any of those things that we were being trained to do would do, <laughs> do any good at all. Um, and so, can, it was not so a, what uh, Woody just saying, there's, there was actually a film of a turtle doing the dance, ducking and covering, and that was one of the kind of training videos for kids. Yep. Clearly, Woody uh, remembers the song. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I'm a vault of useful information. <laughs> Thank I don't you. remember any paranoia over the... Uh, uh, the, th the, the constant threat of nuclear war. In the early 60s, of course, we had the Bay of Pigs invasion, which brought about uh, the, the uh, uh, Cuban blockade, and we probably came as close to World War III during the Cuban Missile Crisis than mm. we have ever. Uh, but e even during that tense three or four days, it's not something I'm, my friends and I worried about. Uh, okay. It just was not a topic of discussion. I don't even remember being talked much about at home. And so did we do um, duck and cover drills on campus? No, no. no. I, I okay. don't remember the subject ever coming up. Okay. We had some torna tornado rehearsals, but <laughs> that's about it. So can we uh, compare that to maybe any of you three with the active shooter drills? You guys have been through active shooter drills? Yeah, yeah so, yeah. On campus? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, you're fine. I feel like for me, it was like seeing it on TV and stuff. You just kind of turned the TV off. Well, that's what I did. And my mom watched the CNN a lot, so I just kind of tried to go to a different room or something. But then I got on social media, and you would still see the stuff on social media. So that was like, I feel like for my generation, our CNN. So I just think it's like sad. And for a minute, it had me kind of paranoid. Um, being like a Sherbert senior because it's like, okay, well, I talk to so many people, but you never know what someone's going through or something like that. And it's just kind of sad that people don't value people's lives, even children's lives. So it definitely had me paranoid for a while. It took some time to get over it, but then at times I'm still on edge about it because I'm like, wow, that could happen any time. Right. So um, from my perspective, I didn't live on campus, so that kind of idea, um, I was always home, so home is always safe, realistically. But um, I think it just opened my eyes because like growing up and still, like we think we're invincible, that nothing's gonna happen. But like seeing things happen um, on campuses like ours is kind of eye-opening. Like, oh, this could happen any day, no, mm -hmm. no matter where we live or walking to your car or whatever. So just kind of eye-opening. Um, I never went through the experience, obviously, but it just reminds us that like, it's possible. Yeah. So like, but here I feel like um, I was in PLI and one of our initiatives that we tried to do was put the safety buttons, those blue lights you see on like state campuses, mm -hmm. um, U of M. And we actually had a trouble with it because a lot of people were, were like, what do you need that here for? Like nothing happens here. So that was like, for our thing, it was like, come on, we're trying to set this in place and get it going. So that was kind of aggravating. But at the same time, it's a good thing that like people on campus don't feel that we need them, so. Even in, obviously, in an active shooting, something like that is a little more um, precedent type of thing, but um, in a current. But I feel like as safety-wise, a lot of people feel safe here, and it's a small campus, so that's nice. That's good. I mean, <laughs> I, when did Columbine happen? 90, 98, 99? 99, I think, or 98. Because I, I remember I was in high school, and I was coming home um, 
from school and just turning on the TV and seeing all of that happen. Um, but being in Chicago Public Schools, um, we have metal detectors in our in our high schools. Um, and granted, at the time when I was going to Shures High School, uh, it wasn't the safest high school. So even then, we still had to just be careful. Uh, um, to this day, the school still actually it's a little bit better, but they provided like clear backpacks um, because you never know if anybody's going to sneak in some type of weapon or anything like that. It's just a you know a different world uh, that I you know grew up in. Early, yeah. Earlier today, um, I was at a mass communication seminar, and I said to the young people here that they're much more involved, uh, much more engaged than we were. And my question is what the response today by today's young people would be to duck and cover in a nuclear attack. Just, I, it's, it's just hard for me to get my head around that. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do. All right, thank you. Thanks for that question. Okay, so I had something that I pulled up that uh, I thought was really interesting as we, as uh, Samantha and I were doing some research on kind of what was happening throughout time. And something that kept coming up was different technologies. So raise your hand in the room if you have a cell phone. I know, you laugh, because everybody has one. Um, so raise your hand if you had a phone in your room on campus? I was the first. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, and, are, okay, this is a ridiculous question. Are there still phones in the rooms on campus? Some of them. <laughs> yeah, not a cell phone, a, a real phone. I had this little round thing. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe. It's an option is the answer. Okay. Um, so we went from getting a phone to maybe getting a phone because you already have a phone. Okay, um, and then I wanted to talk about um, personal computers. Who, who had a computer? Yeah, a you didn't have a computer. <laughs> what did you have, Jeff? Oh. Nothing. Okay, <laughs> pencil. No, we, we had, uh, you know, I think a couple of people had like just the typing uh, machine. Electric, well, not a typewriter, typewriter. but the, I don't even know what they call them anymore. Yeah, like word a word processor. processor. Okay. A few people had that, but you know, we had telephones in the rooms and you know, it was calling cards, which, you know, then phone calls were very expensive to make. And I think a lot of people on campus all had some scam they thought they were running to bill <laughs> minutes back to the college. <laughs> I but remember that. As, as far as I remember, every I one of those. I never did that. Okay. Just for the record. No, every one of those ended with the person getting a gigantic bill and having their diploma <laughs> held up uh, before. So I don't think it worked. It was just, You're, I think, delayed the, the payment a little bit. So did you but finally get your diploma? I did. Okay. <laughs> just check. My parents weren't happy. <laughs> Um, Woody and Tala, do you guys want to talk about getting a phone? <coughs> well, I was Sorry. conducting a long-distance romance. My bride-to-be was back in Massachusetts, so using a payphone was pretty expensive to keep that thing hot. <laughs> <laughs> so rest, rest assured, the day after it was announced students could have telephones, the, the Michigan Bell guy was at my door. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the people who installed the phones. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> My daughter was here 74 to 78, and she must have been involved in that phone scam that we talked about. <laughs> she, she brought me a $96 phone bill, and, and I had never seen a $96 phone bill. So my response to that was, I don't care how you pay it. Well, they'll turn my phone off. Well, I think this is going to end badly. Dr. Blackman, do you want to talk about like how, so we, we were later of us, we're in the age of computers and electronic typewriters. How did you do things like take a test, turn things in? I, I feel like that's a ridiculous question, but I just want you to talk about it. My handwriting wasn't the best, but I had an <laughs> ample opportunity to utilize it. <laughs> <laughs> On the telephone business, there was one, one telephone 
in the hall in Blair, and it seldom rang. I can't remember whether it was a payphone or not. It's a payphone. Uh, Audience, yeah. audience says payphone. Payphone. Okay. It was still there when I got to all of it in 54. <laughs> okay. Still and it was still a payphone. Okay, still there in 68. So did you, you had like a stash of dimes? Yeah. To, to call up didn't use it. <laughs> Oh, you didn't use it? Didn't use okay. It. Be because you wrote letters if you needed something. You called no, it was collect. Used, it was used much more for emergency purposes. Okay. Tell us about Call and Collect. Well, I may be misremembering this, but I don't think I had long-distance service on my room phone. I think I had to make long-distance calls from the hall yep. because I called Collect to my parents, and I'd have nasty comments from my sister every time <laughs> saying, she just wants money. <laughs> <laughs> it was true, but... <laughs> It was an unkind comment. <laughs> if true. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the other thing that I... Uh, okay, two things. One is um, the first home video game in the mid-'80s was Atari. Atari, yeah. <laughs> coin, coin. Oh, man, I could rock coin. out some Atari. <laughs> Yeah, did you have an Atari? I did not. My neighbors, the Pierces, they got it for Christmas. And so all the kids went over to the Pierces' house, and we waited our turn <laughs> to hit that one little ball across the screen. <laughs> you know, it was just the most exciting thing we had ever seen. And so could you, could you take your tissues, and could you demonstrate how to reset an Atari? No, because I, you know, that was too oh, much. Oh, you weren't allowed to touch it. Yeah, you don't touch it. <laughs> no. Anyone? Girl, no. Don't touch it. How to reset the Atari game? Use both. <laughs> 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 I can't use it. I'm a professional. It's okay. Okay. Uh, so, did any of later folks have video games in your room? Gaming systems uh, around? Mo? We had a, I had a PlayStation 1. <laughs> like back in the day, they were like a CD ROM. It's a, we'll still love you. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So, I mean, we just confessed to Atari, okay? Yeah, you can tell I mean, us. <laughs> so, if any of you know what you know, PS1 was, Raise the your graphics hand. PS1. were great at the there time. There we go. You First get, time I get played Resident friends. Evil was amazing. <laughs> Scared the hell out of me. But it was cool, though. <laughs> I mean, you were at Olivet, yeah. home of all ghosts yeah. ever. <laughs> Okay, the other thing I wanted to just note, um, and this is for me, uh, so I graduated one year ahead of Jeff. I got my first email address Ooh. at Olivet College in the computer lab. It was Hotmail. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Of course. Jeff? So did I, and I was told I held on to my Hotmail account for a little too long, and I was finally forced to, to give it up. But Wait, you gave up your Hotmail? I did. It's, it's still out there, I'm sure, but uh, it's yeah, no, I remember the computer lab and the emails and internet was just starting to become a thing, and I was and still am a slow adopter. I said, this isn't going to go anywhere, so why bother? <laughs> 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 so that probably started my uh, be, being slow to the party on a lot of these things, but, but I remember a lot of people really getting into it, and I think that's when people were just getting into like chat rooms yep. and... Like, you know, there's a lot of updated versions of those, but back then they were, they were, they were weird. <laughs> Did you find MySpace or much later? I avo I've avoided almost all social media my okay. entire life. So well, I, I, I stalked I, you on Facebook for this panel, so. You didn't find me. Did I find you on LinkedIn? You found me on LinkedIn. Okay, all right. I Facebook. found you somewhere. <laughs> I wear my lack of Facebook as a, never been on Facebook, and I wear it as a badge of honor. <laughs> I told okay, you it was five it's going bucks away. If you can get Jeff on Facebook, it's it's <laughs> gonna go away now. So I was just ahead of the curve. Mo, when did you get your first email address? Um, honestly, in like high school. Yeah. So like late nineties. Okay, about the same time. Yeah. But I was here on campus when Facebook first started. I remember. It was like, oh, you hear about this new thing called Facebook, and we're like, what's that? And then everybody started having a Facebook on campus. It was, it was different. And, that, and that was, those times, it was only for college students. So it was cool. 
<laughs> but I remember that. And did that ha- change how people communicated on campus? Yeah, people would create and like be like, oh, where are you going? Or, oh, I'm going to class. Or, and then, or in my day, too, <laughs> AIM, AOL Instant Message. So you had to come up with the most creative away message to have. And I would usually put my schedule like, I'm in class from this time to this time. I'm in practice from this time to this time. And then I'm at Phi Alpha. There's and did, later. <laughs> did people actually check your calendar via your aim? Some people would be like, hey, Mo, what's, or what's Mo, Mo doing today? Or something. Or, I, or if I'm looking for somebody, I'm like, where is so-and-so? I would look at what the away message would be. Did they actually look for you? Or do you no, just think they looked for I you? I thought they probably looked for me. I okay. <laughs> So did you leave your I schedule so people knew when to come raid your fridge? What Probably, you yeah. <laughs> or if I were to go to Saronian and flip their furniture, but that's a file alpha thing. Technology has moved so incredibly fast. Mm-hmm. I can remember wishing that I had had a word processor when I was... <laughs> I, I had the old typewriter, and today most of the kids don't even know what a word processor is. I mean, we've it's moved the, so it's far. It's a sad day. We've I moved know. so fast. But we had... Something we call whiteout that we use with our yeah. typewriters. Yeah. You made a mistake, you yeah. put it in and you typed over it. And yeah. But you had to wait <laughs> Writing to paper was to really, really a chore. Uh, it was complicated because you had to, if you typed before it dried, then yes. your letter got all kerflunkety. Yes. Yeah. You remember that? I have a fifth <laughs> on that. <laughs> You My mistakes. Oh, yeah. I made a lot of mistakes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Dr. Blackman, did you have a typewriter, or were you just purely pencil I pen all the way? Oh, we had one at home, but I don't think that I brought it up because uh, I can't remember typed papers. Okay. They're files somewhere. I could go back and look at individual classes and see how I portrayed my knowledge. Nice. And so, Walt, uh, Woody, when you guys typed your paper, did you type it on carbon paper, just in case? Or you just did single paper? No. Single I must have been confident. I don't remember using carbon paper. Okay. Yeah. I, just want, I just want to make sure. Single paper. Right. And the typewriters weighed a ton. Yeah, they did. Yes. Oh, I had a Smith Corona portable. Oh, okay. but, but, Was it uh, fancy? Dr. Blackman would not have had a Corona in, in 46. Right. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Thank you. That was fun. Um, ooh, that was interesting. Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, the, okay, let's go to, let's talk about education for individual and social responsibility, because that's why kind of we're all here, right? Be more, do good, uh, the divine right of doing good to others. All of those are kind of the same things, just phrased differently. So how has that impacted um, your life, your work, kind of how you view things, or has it impacted you at all? Tala, do you want to start? I don't mean to spring it on you, but... Oh, that's all right. Um, I consider that to be foundational to my career and to my personal life, that you've got to respect people. You've got to, number one, love people so that you can mentor them, take care of them, bring them along, share the wealth, and... It, in my career, it's been the longest pole in the tent. Thank you. Um, as for me, uh, the work that I do, I consider it spiritual. Uh, so the initiative that I have, Izzy, uh, our tagline is we leave people, places, and things better than we found them. And, um, you know, that seed was planted in me while I was here on campus. I didn't necessarily recognize it when we had to go to church and, you know, all of that. But, um, you know, and and interestingly enough, the church that I belong to now um, is connected to the congregational church. Uh, We are, we belong to Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so um, just that full circle thing and to be able to come here and, and talk about, you know, be more, do good is... Um, it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Kind of all fits together. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? The, uh, b- before Olivet adopted, officially adopted education for individual and social responsibility and the divine art of doing good to others, it seemed to me that there were people here who were, do- who were practicing that 
long before it mm -hmm. was adopted. And that's one of the things that made this place so special, that people were practicing it even though they weren't saying it. Good point. Absolutely. Uh, I was just going to share that one of the takeaways, and I apologize to the journalism class from this morning. Uh, one of the takeaways I had, I, I, I guess I, I'd want to think that when I got here, I had integrity. Um, but I was given a campus job of running the, uh, the printing department down in the basement of Dole Hall. And uh, among the things I was entrusted with was printing the exams. Um, and tough. if ever someone was entrusted, given a sacred trust, it was someone who was going to be printing up the exams, the <laughs> terms and the finals. Uh, and I just, I had such a kinship with the women uh, in, in Dole Hall, the ladies that uh, support, the support staff people is who I'm talking about, and the administrators who were really trusting me to do the right thing all the time. I couldn't let them down. I mean, there was something, they were trusting me with, uh, with something that was very important. Uh, and that is something that has uh, just been reinforced by being here, and it's something I've carried into my life's work. Uh, you can't succeed without having integrity in all that you do. I'll just add a little like side note. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we're all students. We know service day. Not gonna lie, I took it as a joke when I first got here. Come mm -hmm. like, okay, I'll do the quickest volunteer thing, and then I have the rest of Wednesday off. I know every student thinks like that, but getting to grad school, we have the same thing, um, except it's only once a year. And like, when I got to do it again, growing up, I actually started picking more meaningful things. And so I think starting here, Olivet, um, doing service days has implanted some type of service in me because um, I chose a grad school that we do the exact same thing. So don't take it for advantage, like don't take advantage of it, I guess, so. Thank you. So continuing on in that vein, um, I wanted to talk um, Tala, um, the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts we mentioned a little bit earlier, and then Aaron, uh, maybe Mo, Brittany, talking about climate change. And so that kind of realization that something needed to happen uh, or else mm -hmm. happening in the world. So what did you learn on campus? And this, I think, ties to doing the right thing. But um, what did you learn on campus? And how has that shaped the way that you think about those kinds of topics? As I said, I wasn't as politically inspired <laughs> as a 70s student, um, but I wouldn't make this comment, is that the, the formation of the Clean Air and Clean Water Act is something that um, is foundational to our country, and hopefully we can retain it. And currently now there are some challenges to that, and as well as the EPA. And so those efforts that occurred in the 70s were um, as a result of poisoning our, our waterways and our um, land, and hopefully we don't go backwards on that. And you guys, thank you. I agree with Tala. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say, like, um, like, going with water, we got the automatic water filler water fountain mm -hmm. okay. set up, and I feel like, especially like our era, a lot of people are using more reusable water bottles. Um, the canisters, not just plastic water bottles. And so I feel like that's kind of like our generation's push in it, whether they know it or not, so. Kind of paying attention to the smaller things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, tire nerd, do you have anything to add to this conversation? <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> uh, just um, having a, a lens on just about everything, you know, that impacts Mother Earth. So um, the work that I do uh, with young people, um, having them be aware of the condition of their community, right, from trash to illegal dumping of tires and, and that sort of thing um, is in, imperative for us to be able to survive and continue on and be healthy and vibrant, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
For those of you who don't get the tire nerd reference, I invite you to read Tala's bio and see what her work Logic. is. I'm s <coughs> sorry. It's okay. Sorry. Um, They're twins. Yeah, we are. <laughs> they are. I know. I could barely tell. <laughs> um, so one of the things I heard a lot uh, down the panel was the topic of inclusivity and being inclusive to each other and kind of being insulated from things that were happening in the world that were um, uh, divisive. So I wonder if we could talk about, and maybe um, Walter, you would, or Dr. Blackman would start with this one. Um, Olivet had a founding principle on being inclusive, and in fact, they waited a few extra years to get their charter because they wanted to include women and people of color to be able to come to the college and not get a limited, limited charter to only include white males. So I wonder if um, you could talk about how successful that being inclusive was during your time. Um, and on campus, was it successful or did we miss the mark? The, the fact that all of that was one of the first institutions of higher learning in the state of Michigan to open its doors to minorities and women was not lost on me. Uh, the four years that I was here, my freshman year, I started in a room with a black guy. He decided he wanted to be in a single room. A single room came open, he moved, and a, uh, a guy moved in with me whose name was Tom Pomeroy, who was white. We got along famously. The next two years, my sophomore year, I was in that big room in Blair Hall up on the third floor that has the half moon window that looks out over. There were three of us in there, three black guys in there. One of them went to the Marines. Uh, one of them left and went to Wayne University where he got his degree. And my final year, my roommate was a guy named Don Erskine who happened to be white. Uh, but the point of his being white was so unimportant to me that Terry heard me talk about him for 20 years before she met him. And when she met him, she said, I didn't realize <laughs> that Don Erskine wasn't black. And I said, well, it wasn't, it wasn't important. But I think that there was a lot of that that went on when I was, when I was here. And, and I think we were all better for it. I know that Tom and Don and I learned a lot rooming together. Uh, during my time here, uh, there was an intentional uh, recruitment of students from cities like Saginaw, Flint, City of Detroit. We had one of the largest incoming classes of uh, black students. Uh, and so although I experienced culture shock uh, driving off 94 and just seeing cornfields, uh, when I got here, I looked in the eyes of all of the other students that looked like me, and they all had that same uh, <laughs> look of, like, wow, we're here in the middle of this cornfield, right? Uh, and so, but we made it happen, and we, you know, in addition to the black students, you know, just everybody just came together, and we have these longstanding friendships that still exist today. So it was a, a wonderful experience as it relates to that during my time here on campus. I know you talked a little bit about it earlier, Jeff. Do sure. you want to weigh in? So in 95, when, when I got here, I'd say that there was a similar um, recruitment push to, to bring in minorities. I, for some reason, I remember Chicago being a city that we recruited from heavily. And, you know, I think for me, that just kind of further opened open my lens, um, you know, similar comments to down here, you know, the you know, race, it didn't matter to me, which as I said earlier, like that's, you know, that's not the right attitude. It, it, it does matter, but it can be in a positive way. So, um, so that's, again, just how that kind of shaped my, um, you know, future. So that was, it was important, um, but it was just that it really kind of shaped my development. And I know that was the same as, as a lot of my peers and, and even some of my close friends would say very, very similar things to, to what I'm saying about their time. Great. 
1945, uh, the college employed uh, Cornelius Golightly and his wife, and both of them, I believe, would have been the first uh, black members of the faculty. Mm. Um, I was really, really considered breakthrough, but they're, they were wonderful people. He went on to uh, assume a leadership role at Wayne State. Um, but again, that also sent a message that um, we meant what we said. Absolutely. Good, thank you. <coughs> So questions from the audience uh, now. I know. Steal yourselves. Uh, so we're going to go right down the line. I'm going to give you like one minute to think about it because uh, it could get interesting. What were some common phrases, kind of pop culture phrases, when you were on campus? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Here we go. Think back. Dig it in. Uh, they, they gave a few examples like cool Sick. I don't even know what that means because I'm old, <laughs> clearly. And groovy. Sick meant really, really good. <laughs> oh, okay. In the 50s, that's what it meant? Sick. Or it means that today? Really, really good. Or both? Yeah, really, really good. Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. I had to get a phone a friend from the, from the audience. Those came after my time. All right. <laughs> what, what, what was for you? I can't, I can't come up with one. Okay. All right. We'll come back. Well, I will come up with one later. But all right, not, Woody. <laughs> uh, cool. Cool. That's all I got. <laughs> groovy. You're groovy. Uh, I, 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 come back to me. Okay. <laughs> so there's an iconic phrase. We still use it today. I actually use it as a segment on my um, podcast, but it's what up, though. And so that means a couple things. It means just hello. Or it means, you know, how are you? Uh, what's new? Um, and it's used universally. Uh, and so, uh, what up, though? <laughs> the only thing I can think of, and it might have been actually a little bit after college, was that god awful Bud Light commercial where the guys oh. did the, oh. the, 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 the what's up. The, the, <laughs> I, held, I held back a little bit, but like. I, th was, I think you should just, if you're going to no, do no, it. No, we're not going to do it. But, do, uh, it, no. do it, do it, do it, Jeff. Do it, Mo, do it. No. Do it. What's up? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. That's fun. <laughs> We're going to repeat, put that on repeat, yeah. and then we'll put that on the, on the <laughs> Facebook channel later. Um, man, really put me on the spot. Um, that's dope. Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, or uh, what was the other one? That's what's up. Like, that's what's up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. So I can you tell me what sick means? <laughs> like that's cool. That's yeah. like okay. it's cooler than cool. That's sick. I don't know. Oh, it's like super sick. Yeah. But super you don't have to sick. say sick. <laughs> but not like you got the flu sick though. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't. Does. So I'm still upping walking <laughs> in <Does>. a good <laughs> way. Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, there's like a few I feel like for my generation like we say it's lit or something like that or we're like turn down for what like that <laughs> there's a song right <laughs> turn down for what okay does, I won't do does that heavy Sorry. does heavy have meaning to anybody here yeah we talk about someone being heavy yeah heavy was really really smart yeah. oh, ooh well, that's heavy oh, all right Thick. That's so bad. I just use it. Ooh, that's but but that meant good. That meant good. <laughs> that's right. That's like Michael Jackson bad, right? Okay. What what do you got? Sick. Uh oh. Forgot I, had, I don't. I forgot this isn't muted. But I thought when you said heavy, like a lot of people say, like, oh she's thick, but it's like a good thing. So I thought that's where the heavy was. I, no. Oh, so heavy is <laughs> heavy. Heavy is intellectually. Is intellectually. Heavy, heavy is like heavy whoa. Intellectually, it hurts my brain. Heavy. Heavy, heavy brain. Versus thick <laughs> is what? Like Stupid. she's thicker, but she looks good. It's just like the new era, like curvy. Yeah. It's oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I, you gotta <laughs> just use the words with me. I don't know what it means. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm I feel mute thick on that one. <laughs> uh, audience, just shout it out. Any. Uh, the bomb, the bomb. Oh, love it. Yeah. yeah, that was like the in there. Like okay, what else? So funny. 
Dope. Dope. We already got that one. Dope. Were you not paying attention? Come on, Devin. <laughs> What's happening? For, for real. real. For real, yeah. And for real. But now it's re- revisited because now it's for reals. Ooh. Right on. Right on. Right on. Maybe in the 90s. What else? <laughs> I, didn't, I can't. Tee it up. Tee it up. What does that mean? Like, turn it tea up. It up. Turn. Oh, turn it up? Y- yeah. Because saying, <laughs> saying turn would be a lot, so you just say tee it up. Okay, copy that. <laughs> oh, bougie. bougie. That's bougie. a good one. Bougie. Bougie, yeah. Like fancy? Fancy. Beyond fancy, extra, <laughs> doing the most. Oh. Whoa. What? What do you, Mo, what do you got? No, no hiding. <laughs> Bougiato, that's the other one too. My new my um, cousin has been dropping that word a lot, and I'm like, say it again, say it loud. Bougetto. 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 What's that? What that mean? What's I don't know. What is Bougetto? What's it mean? I don't know. <laughs> it's a combination. It's a combination of. It's a hybrid word. It's a hybrid word. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. Mm. Bouge, bougie and dream. ghetto together. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, don't I don't know. I don't know. I'm guessing here, people. Help a sister out. Not for sure. <laughs> By my own cousin. I, I can't hear you. Okay, thank you. Got my back. I Appreciate that. Anything else? That was a lot. That was heavy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. Um, what is one piece of advice? And I wanna, I'm going to start with Dr. Blackman on this one. We're going to get heavy again just for a minute. So I used that in... Uh, Context. What's one piece of advice for you that you have for us students oh, wow. to succeed <laughs> our best here at Olivet College? Keep Nora, keep doing more of what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Walt, what do you think? You can do it. Believe in yourself, you can do it. I think that's one of the great secrets to success, just believing. And, and yes. there were people here who encouraged us to believe when I was here, and it was incredibly helpful to me as I moved through life. Thank you. Woody? Well, the, uh, really the same thing. You know, be, be true to yourself, be honest, and never be afraid to ask questions. Mm-hmm. Good, that's good. Tala? Uh, take your tasks seriously and give 100% towards the goal of completing those tasks. Thank you. Audra? Take advantage of uh, the small classroom sizes and the access that you have to your leaders and educators. Uh, and also uh, think less about what other people think mm-hmm. and care about wh- what you think about of yourself. Amen. Yep. Amen. I would say two things, uh, kind of related, but build a network. So that's your professors, people at the college, your, your students, um, and then also like invest in finding, you know, mentors, you know, which can be, again, while you're in college, your, your professors, industry people that can, you know, help you as you kind of navigate your way into, into the job. And then, you know, what we, we talked about in the seminar class that I participated in that, you know, being, being a, in a mentee position is, you know, you're not necessarily a drain on that person. You know, that is, can be a rewarding experience for that person who's doing the mentoring and can also be a good development opportunity for them. So it's not a one way, but, you know, when you kind of find that, just make sure that you, you know, really invest in it and, and take it serious and take advantage of the opportunity. Mo? Break out of your comfort zone and take risks. I know it's scary, especially when you graduate college, um, but you need to do that in order to be successful. And to tie that in as well as collaborate with uh, people and actually talk to people. (laughs) Coming from a tech company where everyone emails and IMs, I'll never forget my coworker, IMed me a question on this training that we were developing and I got up and I was like, Paige, I'm literally behind you. Why aren't we talking? (laughs) Why are you sending me an IM? So actually talk to people because that's the human element I feel is being lost Mm -hmm. just because we're we're moving so fast with technology 
that you still need that human element in whatever field you're going into. Aaron? Um, I'd say, um, kind of piggyback on what everyone's <coughs> saying, is take advantage of the here and now. Um, I feel like people complain, people try to find a reason to um, not be their best because of resources, because of where they're at, but that's when you need to be you and stick to who you are and use what is available to you. Um, and like we said, branch out, so. Use your resources, make connections, turn your dreams into realities, and just know the sky is the limit. So don't never stop. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. We've got time for a couple more questions, and I, I got one from the audience that is, um, we're going to start this way and go that way. We're going to mix it up. It's going to get all crazy. Uh, so go down the row and tell your Greek affiliation. New Gamma Xi. Greek. <laughs> Clearly I wasn't cool enough, so. <laughs> phi Alpha Pi. Any Phi Alphas out there? Any? No, they didn't come. Oh, really? Man. Did you expect them to come? Yeah, I was hoping, but oh, <laughs> Man. <laughs> I was not in uh, Greek life here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Almost Sigma. Okay. Almost. Sigma. Kappa Sig. Kappa Sig, all right. I was in Adelphic. Adelphic, Adelphic. all right. Kappa Sig. Kappa Sig, yeah. right on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this one is interesting about um, programs being offered at the college. What do you guys think about the evolution of program offerings away from education and music? Um, Tala was a music major. Education, Woody, uh, Walt, Dr. Blackman? Yeah, doctor. Uh, Mo, thank you. What do you guys think about that? Well, I think it's unfortunate, I understand why, but this college had such a great reputation as a teacher prepare, pre preparation school. Yeah. Uh, it certainly prepared me well, and I'm grateful for that. Um, so I'm just sorry it's not offered anymore. I do understand the requirements now for educational degrees and the administrative burden that's placed on the university or college, and mm -hmm. I, I get that. Um, music, I think, um, I'm sad that it fell off the cart and now it's, but I'm very happy it's back on the cart and an option here at Olivet because, you know, we had the best and the brightest singing in Upton Conservatory yeah. in the 70s. I mean, we rivaled Michigan in their music program, so I hope we can get back to that time again. And we have talented musicians in this State. Of course, I believe music is a really important part of all of our children's educations as well as the future. Yeah, I agree. So, it's ke keeping arts education. Keeping, yeah. Keeping art part of our lives. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, my favorite question of alumni Wh Who was your favorite professor Ooh. and why? Whew, not Just to name one. names in the room. <laughs> Anyone? Dr. Morris Boucher was my favorite professor when I was here. And um, as a history major, I, I understood, and Dr. Boucher uh, helped us to understand that history will always be at its best, his story or her story, because it will always reflect the bias of the person telling the story. And, and that, I found that to be very important. Oh, I like that. Great. Mm. I actually have three, if I mean, that's okay. Just ask for one. Well, I'm going to give three anyway. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've lost control. So it's over. Um, I would say Dr. Knapp. You're right up there. I see you. <laughs> Woo! Uh, Dr. Davis, right here. Why? Because she's sitting in front? No, that's I mean, not cool. I had biology with her. And uh, Cynthia Noyes, are you here? But she was she earlier. Was also she was here earlier. As well. So those were my stuff. three, for Thank sure. Thank you. Who else? I'm too recent to speak on that one. Good, that's <laughs> good. Smart girl right there. Do you wanna? Leonette. <laughs> yeah. Little shout out. <laughs> what about you guys? 
So for me, it was uh, Mike Hubble, who at the time ran the insurance program, which was the field that I went through, and he did a fantastic job running that and getting people prepared and, and helping them with internships and preparing to enter the workforce. Spears. He oh, okay. very approachable and um, inclusive, and he just made that educational experience here really rich. Uh, what did he rich. teach for you? Uh, science. Okay. I would say Dr. Spears as well. He was a fun guy, <laughs> and he made hard subjects enjoyable ah. and easy to remember and learn. And the hardest course I took from Dr. Spear was his botany class, which made me more of a man of letters than ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Fernand Goudreau, head of the uh, education department at the time, okay. and Dr. Leo Hendrick. Without oh. question. Mm. And what did he teach? He was the head of the English department. Oh, okay. Save my bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Blackman, who was your favorite professor? Uh, I think Dr. Akeley, who was um, who introduced me to Margaret Mead and the whole field of anthropology, oh my. Uh, probably had the most impact on me as a young person, younger person. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, what is one, and I think this will be probably our last question, but what's one thing you wish you would have done differently while you were here at Olivet? Dr. Blackman, do you want to go first? Well, let me take uh, a little detour from that and, and comment on an experience that was provided for all freshmen when I was here called Freshman Collections. And the entire faculty <laughs> gathered in the um, great room at Blair Hall, and each freshman came in, and any member of the faculty could make an observation about how his or her year Rough, had gone right? by. <laughs> if you think that wasn't uh, generating uh, anxiety, <laughs> <laughs> as people lined up at the hall of Blair Hall. But um, uh, some amusing thing. Oh, and that was taken as a transcript and then sent to your parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the reason I mention it in this context is that this was a chance to get the assessment. I was going to say judgment, but the assessment of... Uh, <laughs> 20 or 25 people who looked at you from many different vantage points and may not have had you in class, but this also was a time when with the size of a student body uh, that students were known around campus mm -hmm. regardless of whether there was an instructor-teacher relationship. And Mr. Brewer, who was then president, apologized to some of his colleagues because some of them were commenting about the fact that I was easily distracted and that he had inadvertently um, been an enabler because I would seek to borrow his 1940 Hudson convertible and give it a bath. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you do the in the 1940s? That came out, but it did um, highlight things that you wish you had done your freshman year and hopefully provided some guidance for the next three years. I'm not sure how well that stuck, but at least the intent was good. And so what did you do when you borrowed this 1941 Hudson convertible? That never, uh, no utilization ever occurred, although I did borrow Teacher Cops 1941 Packard, Packard, excuse me, Ford, um, and took it to Marshall for dinner at Schuler's. <laughs> and uh, the amusing part of that was that when we came out, the radio would warm up uh, as you turned on the ignition, and we had just filled ourselves at Schuler's, and the ad came on. Bromus seltzer, bromus seltzer. <laughs> <laughs> Timing is everything. <laughs> Walt, thank you. Walt, what would you do differently? Um, I'd probably add a lot more music to my education. I've always felt that that's a big hole in my education. I wasn't good at it, 
so I didn't do it. But mm. I, I, going all the way back through school, I would have done more music. Thank you. Woody, what about you? You know, I'm not sure that I would have changed a thing. I had good guidance when I was here, really solidified my path and, and desire to become an educator. Um, life was good. I <laughs> wouldn't good. change a thing. Thank you. I would have practiced more. Everything uh, or something specific? My voice. Okay. I w it, it came easy for me, but I would have, I should have practiced more. Okay. Um, I'm self-described as painfully shy when I entered Olivet, and so I think, uh, I wish I would have found my voice earlier and uh, taken advantage of more opportunities. I was too, in, too much in my head, um, and so that's what I would do differently. Jeff? I would have picked elective courses, probably not based on the fact of which one's going to be the easiest, and actually, <laughs> you know, pick something that I could get get something out of. Um, I know it's a fine line between you know doing what you have to to you know graduate, and you know, I, I was focused on graduating in four years, but also looking for some of those experiences that could be could be more rewarding. So I think putting a little more thought into that would probably be the one thing. Mo? I'm with Woody. I actually wouldn't change a thing. I had a really great experience here. Good. Aaron? Not that I didn't have a good experience, but I think I would have um, got involved more in mission trips and the weekend volunteers. Um, I always told myself, like, you're playing basketball, you're involved in this, like, you don't have time for that, when in reality, I probably did. So I would have done that. So. I'm having a great experience. <laughs> 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 but if I could go back to freshman year, I would definitely use my resources. Differently. Yep. Okay. So I want to thank all of you for coming today. Please help me thank our panelists. Thank you so much. Nice job. Thank you.